Hi, welcome everybody to this uh, webinar on ammonia stripping, recovery, and reuse from high strength ammonia wastewater. Um, my name is Brian Johnson and I'll be your presenter today. Uh, I work with Organics, Organics Group, uh, in a business development role throughout North America and also the Asia Pacific region. Uh, but we also have a couple of our directors here and I'll have them introduce themselves now, starting with uh, Mark Molden. Hello, yes, I'm Mark Molden. I'm the technical director at Organics. Uh, I'm based in the UK, but I tend to get involved in all of the commissioning. Um, so I hope I can answer any of your technical or operational queries that might arise. Hi, my name's Keith Richardson. I'm based in the UK as well at the moment under lockdown. Um, hope everybody's uh, safe and well. Um, I'm here to uh, talk about commercial aspects of the, the, uh, the, the ammonia strip. All right, thanks guys. So first, we'll, our agenda for today will be roughly about a 25 minute presentation, uh, followed by a, a question and answer session that will be uh, directed by Keith. Uh, so during that time, during the presentation, if you have any questions, just uh, please type them in the, um, in the control panel uh, under the questions box, uh, and we'll keep a log of those and get those answered for you at, at that time. Uh, also, uh, we'll unlock the, the speakers at that time. So if you do want to, uh, to speak uh, your question, have a dialogue, uh, you'll be able to do that as well if you unmute yourself uh, during that session. So uh, also, if there are any technical queries, just type them into the, uh, the chat box. Uh, we have someone watching out to see uh, if there's any problems with, with any sound or, or video quality. So uh, other than that, uh, also there are three handouts uh, for you to download if you like. Uh, a copy of this presentation is there. Uh, under the control panel, as well as a published article recently on the technology, uh, and lastly, uh, a data sheet covering it as well. So at this time, I'll ask everyone to, uh, our directors here, to turn off their cameras and mute their microphones, and I'll get started on the presentation. So again, this, this presentation will focus on ammonia, thermal ammonia stripping, recovery, and reuse from high strength ammonia wastewater. And it's brought to you by Organics, which is a, a turnkey process engineering company specializing in wastewater treatment and renewable energy. So today we're here to raise awareness about thermal ammonia stripping and the applications associated with recovery and reuse. We also aim to dispel any myths there might be with these processes. It's a process that is applicable to all wastewater types. Uh, we, it's a proven technology and also a bankable one uh, that can be an attractive option for facilities with high strength ammonia wastewater. And we also hope to identify new opportunities for full scale projects, pilot projects, as well as identify those that are interested to build, own and operate. So the key messages that we'll cover here today, uh, number one, ammonia can be reliably recovered from a range of wastewater streams, and we'll discuss how the technology is developing to reuse the ammonia for a potential fuel source. The processes that we're outlining today aren't new, and we've been developing these systems for over 20 years. And the process is best suited for any high strength ammonia wastewater, uh, that's including thermal hydrolysis side stream liquors, anaerobic digestion centrates, and landfill leachate. Ammonia in wastewater is, is also a resource now in that it can be reliably recovered in several different forms. Once it is recovered, it can also be sold to various off-takers. And lastly, there are some environmental benefits to the process, one of which is greenhouse gas mitigation. So some background on the history of our company briefly. Organics began operating in 1996, originally building landfill gas systems. And around this time, we patented this particular thermal ammonia stripping process. Our first thermal ammonia stripper was completed in 1999, and it's still in operation today. And since then, we've built 14 more, with three more currently under construction. We've expanded its application during, during this time to anaerobic digesters, thermal hydrolysis, and also agricultural and industrial waste streams. Uh, outside of ammonia stripping, we've completed over 300 projects worldwide, many of them for a number of blue chip clients, so for example, Suez or Veolia. And our headquarters is in the UK, uh, but we do have subsidiaries throughout the world, including in the US, Asia, and Australia. 
So there are several drivers that led to the development of this technology. Uh, the original ammonia stripping plant that was, uh, was built to process leachate, uh, but since that time we've expanded its capabilities uh, to a number of other uh, wastewater streams such as thermal hydrolysis and aerobic digesters and wastewater uh, treatment. Uh, our first plant, uh, which was developed uh, for Suez, processes uh, ammonia levels of over 6,000 milligrams per liter. Uh, biological processes were used previously uh, at this site and proved to be an expensive due to the chemicals involved in the process. So our client also had unused landfill gas that required disposal at that time. Uh, so that created an opportunity for thermal stripping to utilize the available gas for heat production to power the process. So getting into chemistry behind it briefly, uh, the relationship between ammonia gas and, ammonium, and the ammonium ion is shown here. So within the stripping process, we're seeking to create conditions where the ammonia uh, gas is maximized. And we do this mainly by controlling the temperature. So this equation here is basically outlining that, ammonia, that the ammonium ion plus uh, a base is used to raise the pH and produces ammonia gas in water. We've developed this technology to, to avoid the use of pH raising chemicals by adding heat to this process. The graph here indicates that as pH increases, the propensity of ammonia to occupy the gas phase also increases. However, however, the graph also shows that as temperature increases, the gas phase can also be achieved even at a neutral pH. So typically air stripping of ammonia first requires a significant increase to the pH in order to remove the gas. Uh, and then you add large amounts of air to strip off the ammonia. But by adding heat to the process, raising of the pH is no longer required for typical wastewater streams. So, and this significantly, significantly less air is needed to remove the ammonia with this process. So this is one of the main advantages of our process to thermal stripping. And as a summary of what's taking place within the strip room, uh, there are two principal reactions happening. The first is that the ammonium ion bond is broken by heat alone, and then is converted into uh, ammonia gas. And the second is that the ammonia gas is removed from the wastewater by means of air stripping. So why is this particular system so relevant now? Well, when we first developed the technology uh, back in the 90s, there was, a, there was a, a unique combination of high ammonia and basically free heat in the form of landfill gas. Uh, it was originally a very high strength, intensive, high energy intensive process. However, as uh, this slide demonstrates, since then, uh, the efficiency of the system has increased uh, dramatically in the development of each plant. We've reached a point now that allows us to recover the heat, uh, to use recovered heat rather than primary fuel. So in addition to this, ammonia recovery uh, has moved more into the mainstream uh, with a stronger emphasis placed on the circular economy within the wastewater industry. So this has opened up new markets for ammonia recovery and, re and reuse throughout the world. Now there are a number of benefits to thermal stripping and to name a few, uh, it is a proven process tested on a number of wastewater uh, types, thermal hydrolysis, anaerobic digesters and leachate. And it's a process that's been working for over 20 years. It's a system that was, uh, it's a system that was made specifically for high strength ammonia wastewater. And a particular note, implementation of a system like this would really begin around a thousand milligrams per liter. Uh, the lower limit removal rate for this system is down to about 100 milligrams per liter. So to give you an example, with, with higher levels of ammonia in wastewater, uh, about 5,000 milligrams per liter, uh, to use that as an example, uh, that would give you about a 98% removal rate. The process lowers greenhouse gas emissions as well compared to alternative methods of treatment. Some cost benefits to mention uh, are that no chemicals are used, no sludge is produced during the process, it has a small footprint, typically around 20 meters by 20 meters. Uh, ammonia is uh, not only removed, but it can also be recovered, which provides a potential revenue source as well. There's also a lot of flexibility in the process. It can handle large fluctuations in ammonia without much difficulty at all. Uh, either waste heat or primary fuel can be used to, to drive the process. And the system can be built horizontally or vertically if height restrictions or available space is an issue. And the operation and maintenance are much easier in comparison to biological methods. Uh, I'll go into more detail on that on later slides, 
but to give you a couple uh, advantages, it has a rapid startup time and shutdown time, typically about an hour. And the plant has a high availability rate of over 95%. So here's a component layout uh, first to give you an idea of the flow of the system before we take a picture of the actual system on the next slide. This particular layout removes and destroys ammonia and is the main configuration that we've constructed with our plants. We've recently adapted this configuration though to add recovery options to serve other markets around the world. So starting on the right hand side, we have heat recovery equipment. Primary heat is recovered from the thermal oxidizer uh, exhaust using an economizer to heat the, a water circuit, which then distributes the heat. And on the left-hand side, we have the stripping column where ammonia gas is separated from the wastewater. Wastewater is fed in through the top and heated air enters in through the bottom of the column. And the ammoniated air is then directed back to the thermal oxidizer, which has two functions. It combusts both biogas and ammoniated air, and it also recirculates heat to efficiently power the process. So this picture gives you an idea of what the thermal stripper looks like. This particular system is located in the Western Tor Territory of Hong Kong. Uh, here you can see the different components uh, mentioned in the layout. So you have the thermal oxidizer there on the left. You have the stripping column on the right. And the economizers and heat exchangers are stacked towards the bottom. So the organic thermal stripper is an effective and efficient method of removing the high strength ammonia wastewater uh, for wastewater treatment plants, providing the lowest whole life cost treatment option. For sewage treatment, the ammonia stripper can be typically be, uh, is typically located after the anaerobic digester or after the thermal hydro hydrolysis process, or may be used as an effective side stream treatment of high strength sludge liquors that are typically seen in ammonia levels in the range of about 1,500 to 3,000 milligrams per liter. So the optimal position is really governed by the effluent characteristics uh, as well as other treatment methods being employed and also the overall treatment objectives of the plant. Now once the ammonia is stripped from the wastewater you basically have five options in dealing with the remaining byproduct. So you could you could destroy it using a thermal thermal destructor or thermal oxidizer. Uh, it can be recovered as ammonium hydroxide. Then it can be further processed to produce anhydrous ammonia, which has many industrial applications. Alternatively, it can be recovered as a salt, typically used in fertilizer. And lastly, ammonia can even be used for on-site power production. Uh, each of these options that you see for power production are at various stages of development. So anywhere, it's, it's anywhere from market ready, uh, for example, hydrogen fuel cells, uh, to around 18 months out uh, to hitting the market. For example, that would be an ammonia engine. Now we do need a, a source of heat uh, to remove the ammonia though. Uh, and a good benchmark of measurement for that heat requirement is about 50 megajoules. Now if using biogas to power the system, another benchmark to point out is around 250 cubic meters per hour is used for a 500 cubic meter per day uh, uh, size system of wastewater. Uh, the heat required is very strongly correlated with flow rate. So if for Americans listening today, uh, just a quick calculation, uh, that equals around 160 uh, cubic feet per minute of biogas uh, and is used to process about 130,000 gallons of wastewater per day. Uh, waste heat from gas engines uh, would, would require uh, two one megawatt engines in this example uh, for this flow rate uh, to generate that kind of heat. And lastly, steam available on site is also a viable option for a heat source. Uh, and even in today's climate with cheaper natural gas available, even that could be a possible option as well. So this figure here, it gives a layout of the process for recovering ammonia as ammonium hydroxide. Stripped ammonia air, uh, sorry, stripped ammoniated air is passed into a cold water scrubber and ammonia is, all, is really highly soluble in water and can be concentrated anywhere from 15 to 30% depending on the storage temperature. Now after you create ammonium hydroxide, you can take it a step further uh, in the process uh, and create anhydrous ammonia 
which uses a distillation method. Ammonium hydroxide is passed through a rectifier to concentrate the ammonia further. The end, uh, in the end, the product is cooled and then compressed and is typically stored at around 10 bar. So I'll walk you through an example of, of a process uh, of, of reusing ammonia as a fuel source from beginning to end. So first the heat is needed to power the whole process. So in the beginning there, uh, in this scenario, it's recovered from a gas engine. Then the heat is directed to a stripping column to remove the ammonia from wastewater. And next in step three, we recover it as ammonium hydroxide using a cold water scrubber. Taking a step further, we distill the ammonia and use a rectifier to concentrate it, turning it into anhydrous ammonia. After which it can be stored and transported if needed. Uh, and then it's ready to be used as a fuel source uh, by cracking the ammonia uh, and extracting the hydrogen to be used in a fuel cell and then sent back to the chosen point of use. So that's sort of the life cycle from beginning to, to end of, uh, of removing and recovering the ammonia and reusing it. So there, is, uh, there are some energy potential uh, of recovered ammonia, and here's an example of it. The process at the top of the slide, let's say uh, working left to right, covers the conversion of ammonia for use in hydrogen fuel cells. So for every ton of ammonia recovered, two megawatt hours of electricity can be produced. So what that means is uh, two megawatts of electricity for one hour with one ton of ammonia, or about 85 kilowatts per, per 24 hours. Uh, this process, uh, the process at the bottom outline, working from left to right, is one that's still in development stages, and it, and it would use a solid oxide fuel cell. It has the potential to be even more efficient than hydrogen fuel cells. So an example here, for every ton of ammonia recovered, uh, more than three megawatt hours of electricity could be produced. So what that means is three megawatts of electricity for one hour with, for one ton of ammonia, or around 125 kilowatts. So there are some environmental benefits to using a thermal stripper over traditional method is, methods. And in, in this example, that would be aeration. So on the left-hand side, recovery of ammonia requires less electrical energy than aeration by a ratio of three to one. Ammonia recovery does, does require thermal energy though. So that is, that's of note, uh, which comes in the form of waste gas or waste heat. The co next comparison there, uh, demonstrates that nitrous oxide production is virtually eliminated with ammonia stripping, where it remains an issue with aeration. And next is a simple comparison um, showing the power production potential of ammonia recovery versus aeration, uh, which of course aeration is not capable of recovering uh, any power or producing any power. Uh, a comparison of the carbon footprint here, uh, it shows that aeration produces a significant carbon footprint uh, in our example, almost uh, 36,000 tons of CO2 equivalent per year, compared with a, a near zero carbon footprint of thermal ammonia recovery. So next we'll get into the cost, uh, or the size relative to the cost of the system, including some of the key technical and commercial parameters of a typical system. So configurations, thermal loading, and costs certainly do vary uh, depending on the recovery method chosen. So this is an indicative equipment supply figure, uh, and installation costs certainly do depend on location. But uh, the concentrations of, uh, let's say in this example, 2,600 milligrams per liter with a flow rate of 500 cubic meters per day costs around $2 million. It would produce about five tons of ammonium hydroxide. Uh, alternatively, uh, it would produce more than a ton of anhydrous ammonia, which would then produce just over 100 kilowatts of on-site power. The discharge ammonia concentration here is at, about, is at 200 milligrams per liter, but it's, no, it's worth noting that this can be brought down to less than 100 if needed. Now, I've talked a lot about ammonia recovery today, uh, but these are the potential off-takers for recovered ammonia. So it's used in everything from fertilizer, uh, cleaning products, pharmaceuticals, uh, and chemical production. When recovered as a salt, it's used in fertilizer. Uh, and ammonium hydroxide and anhydrous ammonia are used for all the other applications listed. So if you're looking to sell the recovered ammonia, typical prices fall within these ranges, 
uh, anywhere from $400 to $650 per ton. It is dependent on location as well, but it does serve as a good guideline for those interested to sell the recovered ammonia. Now getting into power production, uh, as potential for the use of ammonia for on-site power develops, we'll begin to see the benefits as time goes along. We've discussed its development in fuel cells. However, ammonia engines are beginning to enter the market as well. And one example of that is from a company called Man Energy, uh, who are currently testing them on naval ships. Uh, a few benefits of those ammonia engines are that uh, there aren't any green greenhouse gases produced, uh, no odors, low noise pollution, and it has a, a small footprint. These systems are also modular in size and scalable for individual on-site use, which could be quite a benefit in remote areas. Some of the operation and maintenance involved in, uh, in thermal stripping uh, is what you see listed here above. Uh, it requires little manpower, just with one operator, maybe two if you wanted to back up, uh, which can share duties across an entire wastewater treatment plant. The startup and shutdown times are an hour or even less. Plant availability, again, is uh, over 95%, and it requires just a few days of downtime every few months. So every quarter, uh, it would need some cleaning of the packing within the column. The operating cost associated with the system, uh, single line sizes can range anywhere from 100 to 5,000 cubic meters a day in size and flow rate. Uh, it's a modular system, so additional lines can be built alongside one another for larger flow rates. You do need some electricity for the process, which falls within that range uh, that you see there. Some makeup water is needed. Uh, also, polypropylene packing is needed in the column. And you need a source of heat to power the process. And then lastly, of course, we talked about this, but you need someone to run the system as well, some manpower. So now we'll get into some uh, two references uh, before we wrap up the presentation portion of the webinar today. And our first reference we have here is a side stream application for wastewater treatment of an anaerobic digester. So this was the first food waste uh, AD facility to be built in Hong Kong and was completed just, uh, just a couple of years ago. So the ammonia stripper is located along the effluent line from the facility and is primarily concerned with discharge compliance. And the placement option, uh, for example, would be at option three mentioned uh, in the earlier in the presentation on the anaerobic digester slide. Uh, and then at this place, it really gives it the lowest possible discharge level, which is under 100 milligrams per liter. And our second and final reference uh, is a landfill operated by Veolia. We've built two lines at this facility uh, as they've redesigned, redesigned their landfill. And this, this one, this particular one is located on the eastern part of Hong Kong. So this particular system was retrofitted into the treatment facility uh, where you see it standing now, an SBR was located there previously. It, it required definitely some, some careful planning to take in consideration the existing footprint available at the time. This system removes uh, eight, eight tons of ammonia per day and achieves a removal rate of over 97%. And we also finished the second line just a few months ago. So this really this wraps up the presentation portion of the webinar today. Uh, we'll begin the question and answer session of the webinar now. And at this time, I'll ask our directors to turn on their cameras and microphones. Uh, and this portion of the session will be led by Keith Richardson. Uh, so let's begin. Brian. Yeah, thanks, okay. guys. Um, yeah, thanks, guys. Okay, yeah. so uh, we've, we've got, a, got a few questions already. Um, to say, just if you'd like to speak or, or ask a question, let, let me know. Otherwise, just type it in. Um, how often does the packing media need to be replaced, Mark? Uh, it never needs to be replaced. I mean, what we typically do is uh, we would recommend that you have an entirely spare set of packing ready to go so that when it's time to clean it which is either quarterly or half yearly depending on how dirty uh, the how quickly the build-up occurs um you just swap out the clean packing for the new and you can do it in a, in a couple of days a couple of three days then you clean the packing at, uh, sort of at your leisure over the next uh, three to four months while the, the product blocks up again and, and during the cleaning process you might get some breakages 
So you might need to top up maybe 10% a year. It's a number like that. So you never actually have to replace the entire lot, but you might lose some due to breakage during the cleaning process. So maybe 10% a year, something like that. And following on from that, um, how long is the system down in the uh, quarterly maintenance? Uh, typically, they the, the sites we work at schedule about a week, uh, working week, five days, um, and they will in, in that time they will remove the packing and replace the packing, but not clean the packing. So they'll have the clean packing ready to go, and then the standard servicing of the electric pumps and um, motors and, and all the other bits and pieces, the heat exchangers. Um, for the quarterly service, and then there is maybe a five yearly overhaul where they clean the internals of the heat exchange surfaces, which can be more like two weeks. Right, and um, a couple of people asked, do you need a standby system during the maintenance? Uh, you don't, it depends what your problem is. So that if you're running a landfill site, for instance, you typically have large leachate storage lagoons, um, so you can buffer a certain amount of your wastewater. If you don't have a buffering system available, um, like for instance, at that one of our reference plants that Brian mentioned was the organic waste treatment facility in Hong Kong. Uh, they produce uh, wastewater constantly as part of their process and they have nowhere to put it because of site uh, space constrictions. So as a result, they had a system with two ammonia stripper towers in it. So they uh, predicted the problem and ordered a, a standby column um, as part of their system. So not necessary, but certainly useful. Right, right. And, and, a, and a follow on from that one is what, what, what is the start, a typical startup time? Um, and is, is that actually included in the three days? Uh, the startup time, sorry, uh, right, from, from, from commissioning or from the standard start? Uh, commissioning. No, if we, if we, yeah, sorry. If we if we're down in in, in terms of uh, cleaning, we yes, um, so, and we replace the media. Um, yeah. What would be a typical startup time? I think we uh, Brian referenced it in, in the right. Uh, yes, one hour. Um, one hour, and that is when we use a lot of the heat recovery systems. So because we use a system of heat recovery to supply about two thirds of the energy required. Um, obviously on startup, there's no energy to recover. So you input about a third of the required energy and then you recover more and more and more. Um, so the, the more efficient the system, the slower the startup. And we found about an hour is a sensible number. One of the earlier systems we did, uh, when the heat was not a problem, uh, we could start it up in about 10 minutes uh, because we just had all of the heat available almost instantly by turning on the, the, the big button and, and regenerated steam within five minutes and the system was up at temperature five minutes later. So it's a balance between a recovery of reused heat and primary heat input for startup time, about an hour. Right, great, great. Um, in terms of suspended solids or total suspended solids, what's the uh, sort of optimal um, level of suspended solids that we deal with? Uh, suspended without solids pre, without pretreatment. Obviously, there's pretreatment options, but I mean, right. what would be the typical? Yes, without pretreatment. I mean, so solids can be an issue. Um, plastics carry over from uh, waste treatment facilities, but as long as the solids remain genuinely in suspension, so suspended solids of three thousand milligrams a liter and upwards, even it can can be managed as long as they genuinely remain in suspension. Um, obviously, the the column is to a certain extent a large filter so it'll pick up larger solids as i say plastics was a particular bugbear and did cause some problems um until we could uh, get them pre-treated at the front end uh but but otherwise suspended solids not really an issue pass through in suspension we use very robust pumps there's nothing really in the system that can suffer from suspended solids Right. Okay. Thanks. Um, another follow-on question is: uh, What what is the lowest ammonia concentration uh, in the uh, effluent that we typically uh, can, can deal with? Uh, it's a good one. So the lowest, the, the removal of ammonia is non-linear. So the first lump of ammonia, if you like. So if you give me an effluent of about three thousand, to get it down to fifteen hundred is very easy. So the, the first cut. 
uh, is very simple. We, we do it in stages, so we, we size it in stages, and each stage you remove about half the ammonia. But it's a non-linear exponential actual asymptoting to, 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 no, to nothing um, removal curve, so that the lower the concentration, the harder it is to remove the ammonia. As a result, we can get it down to, say, from some 3,000 down to 1,500 very easily, from 1,500 down to three or 400 in, a, in, a, in another couple of steps. To go from three or 400 down to less than 100, which is our minimum, takes almost as much heat and energy as it does to get it from 3,000 down to 400. So it's, a, it's, a, it's important that we understand the incomer and the outgo requirement because it can have a massive impact on the energy requirements in the system. So to answer the question, less than 100, I think the best I've ever managed is about 50 something. Um, it's impossible to remove anything more than that due to the, the partial pressures in the system. Uh, but yes, it's a, it's a, it's a curve with uh, energy intensive uh, requirements, but they work in blocks. So, but the first half is much easier to remove than the, than the, than the, the remaining bits. Okay. Great, thanks. Um, another question is, uh, how much aqueous ammonia is uh, possible to recover from a typical thermal hydrolysis plant? So I guess that would be something like a, maybe a Canby system, um, presumably with a concentration of around about 1,500 to maybe 2,500 milligrams in the, a litre in the, um, in, maybe in the, in, in the liquor, in the source yeah. liquor. Well, that's going to depend very much on the, on the flow rate. Um, but, you know, if you're coming in at, 2000 and we could take out if it's coming at 2000 you could recover up to 1900 milligrams per litre of ammonia and then multiply that by your number of litres and that's your potential uh, number of hours in a day and you can come up with the, the potential ammonia recovery from that product um, so it really is it's flow dependent um, but as Brian mentioned some of these flow rates at um, some of the bigger plants for instance 1500 cubic meters a day, uh, three or 4,000, maybe 5,000 on the incomer, they're generating eight tons of ammonia a day. So you can pro rata that, those numbers around in your head to suit. Okay, okay, great. Um, another, another question uh, we have is regarding uh, height restrictions. If there are planning issues or any height restrictions, how would yep. we deal with it? Uh, well, we use gravity. Um, so these, the ones that you can see on the, the picture there, they're around 20 meters in height. Um, <clears throat> we use gravity, so we pump it off the top, we allow gravity to allow the liquor to feed down through. If there are height restrictions, then you can use multiple systems in series of lower heights, but you spend more money on more smaller pumps rather than the most efficient version, which is one larger pump. But we can have it operating in, in rather than one 20 you could have it in two tens four fives you do the maths right right and in terms of um uh, how, how much uh, additional thermal demand does the uh rectifier require uh the, oh, for, to, for the anhydrous ammonia sorry to produce anhydrous yes yeah difficult to give you an answer off the top of my head there's it's there's a lot of different things that feed into it uh, and uh, I know this sounds like passing the buck but I prefer to get some specifics into it there is a there is more than one criteria that I need to have into take into account so if I can get that question emailed then I can answer it far better than trying to give you some ad hoc numbers now okay so we'll, we'll come back to you on that one uh, yeah Sasha okay um, Another another question is: uh, Do we have installations in cold climates? And how cold? Um. <laughs> Ammonia strippers? No, we don't have. We, we've installed plenty of plants in cold climates. Um, I've worked up um, north of um, Detroit and installed some flares up there, so we understand working in cold climates and uh, sub-zero temperatures, um, and plenty of stuff in Scotland here. So yes, we understand working in cold climates. Um, the ammonia stripping process uh, does, it's a thermal process, so it requires heat, but everything is clad so that it's just a matter of insulation and, and efficiency. So yes, 
Um, yes, but I, I think I, I think our, uh, our, our friends are actually thinking very cold climates and perhaps a bit further. Canadian north. cold. Canadian climate, yeah. Wow. Okay, that's okay. Canada, yes, that's that's properly cold. <laughs> uh, I, I'm I'm afraid I've only ever worked in in very North America, uh, uh, U.S. cold. But um, yeah, I'm sure we can work it out. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that wastewater treatment plants do uh, still work in, in winter. I, I believe they, they treat their water up there. Yes. Yeah. Negative forty. Okay, that's that's pretty cold. <laughs> uh, we've we've operated plant. Um, as I say, I'm trying to think of the name of the plant up, um, that we did a flare stack up there and some some plant up there that had some some treatment systems on it that um, needed to run at those temperatures, maybe negative thirty. Uh, yes, yeah, so we're we're aware of the requirements, and yes, it can be made to work like that. Right. Okay. okay. Would anybody else have a question? Any any other queries? Um, one question is uh, where or how much space do we need as a lay down area for the uh, uh, for, for for the actual um, media when we're cleaning? Is it a large area uh, or just a small area to do the wash down? The, the wash down area. Well, I think yes. You can see it in the picture there. There's a there's a concrete box in the bottom left hand corner beside the organics logo. That's the wash area. And they put a grate in the bottom of there and they just mechanically clean it with a pressure washer over the top. Uh, the rest of the packing is stored in um, bulk bags, so meter cube bags, which they just stack up uh, on this side. They do it along the tree line on the right there um, and just bring it across for cleaning and, and then store it back over there. So it, what, what have we got in there? 120 cubic meters, something like that, 140 cubic meters. So, yeah, picture that in bags stacked up. Yeah. Okay, and how, how do we uh, how do we control NOx emissions? Uh, NOx they, emissions, well, using the oxidizer. Yes. Well, yes. I mean, with, with thermal destruction of ammonia, it is a danger because one of the combustion routes for ammonia is to NOx. Um, it, it's a kinetic process. So it either goes to NOx or it goes to uh, to water and nitrogen. So it's um, you do have to control it carefully. And we have got. Um, Mm, three or four things that we use. So we've got, first of all, we've got two places where we can introduce the ammonia. We can either introduce it as primary air or as secondary air. We can then introduce the combustion gas either uh, above or below the ammoniated air. And then we've also got careful temperature control of, uh, of the combustion air that we allow in on top of the ammoniated air. And finally, we use exhaust gas recirculation so that we can use the uh, low oxygen exhaust gas, bring it back in at the bottom as a cooling gas to allow us to bring in cooling gas without additional oxygen. So we have three or four methods that we go to site and we tune up um, when we have to pass our emissions test during commissioning, usually with the local government authority. Okay, thanks for that. Um, would we have any other questions? I don't think we do. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, that wraps up the question and answer. Yep. All right. So, very good. So, um, yeah, if you have any more questions in the future, feel, feel free to contact any one of us. Uh, you'll get an email after this uh, webinar with all of our contact information, the, the three of us, Mark, Keith, and I. Um, also, uh, don't forget to download the handouts uh, before you go if you haven't already. And um, we'll, we'll also, in the future, we'll be diving deeper with further sessions uh, covering ammonia treatment, uh, recovery, and reuse. So keep an eye out for those as well. Uh, but other than that, we're, we're done for today. I appreciate everyone coming out today and, and listening to us. And um, yeah, if you, if you have any questions, contact us later. And uh, have a wonderful day. Uh, Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Stay, stay yeah. safe. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.